Let's get started. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Paul Wallace. Paul has a bachelor's degree from Brown University in art semiotic, and then he went to the video game industry, and actually to an interesting branch of it, namely advertisement. And so he was at a company called Enfarm, and he led uh, the campaigns for a number of games that you've heard of, like Angry Birds or Assassin's Creed. And uh, he was the producer of those campaigns, and he also won awards for them. And so after doing this for five years, he felt it's time to go back to academia, uh, come back to Stanford and do his PhD, and uh, basically to reflect on his industry experience and somehow write academic papers about and around it. And so this is what also his talk is about, reflecting on these two uh, aspects. So welcome, Paul. Hey, Kumar, thank you so much. Guys, I am so flattered to be here with you today and have the opportunity to share some of the work that I got to make over the past five years in the video game industry. Uh, the company I worked for was called The Ant Farm. And while I loved working there and am so honored to have been with the amazing teams that I got to be with, and I'm proud of the work that I'll show you, I did leave advertising for a reason. I desired a different type of engagement. I wanted something a little more theoretical, a little more philosophical, something more academic. So that's why I'm here today. Not just here in this room, but here now at Stanford for the next five years. Um, my hope is to fuse my production work with my academic work. So this talk will kind of be that fusion. So I'm going to present to you the roadmap of my research and some of the theoretical tools I'll be working with to get there. Uh, our goal today, our destination, is to have an understanding of how exploration works. How exploration sort of blooms into something much more complex. So my thesis is this, that exploration is the embodied process of creating worlds and identities. So to get there, we're going to have to go on a little bit of a journey. We are going to look at the structure of the interface. We're going to look at the nature of consciousness. We will look at video game worlds, story, and emotion. We'll check out some of the trailers that I produced for Assassin's Creed 4. We will look at rule-based emergence. We'll look at complexity and possibility space. And your takeaway after all of this is to have kind of a clear picture as to how all these terms work together in concert. And I hope to do this for you visually. So today, we are map makers, and exploration will be our key. So I'm going to start with a game from this year called Beyond Eyes. I, uh, now, I personally really dislike showing video games as, as films, because as you gamers know, games are something you do, not something you watch. But for the sake of time and convenience on a computer, I'm going to have to show you a clip. So the, the developers, for those who haven't heard of this, describe this game as a blind girl named Ray braves her anxiety and goes on a journey to find her only friend, a cat, surrounded by an unseen world full of life waiting to be revealed. Now, why am I showing you this video? Because it is very stripped bare. It is, it is slow. What you're about to see is nothing more and nothing less than the unfolding of a world via the act of exploration. So as you watch, pay special attention to the relationship between the visuals that you see and the shifting data that creates it. The clip is about two minutes long. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. So, as you saw, what you do in this game is pretty much just walk around and explore the world. This is actually a subgenre of video games called a walking simulator. Uh, in these type, uh, thrilling, I know. In these types of games, the primary interface that you have with the game rules is just the game world and the ability to explore it. So this, this world as interface concept becomes complicated in Beyond Eyes because our heroine is blind and the world for her is not a given. So navigating via sound and touch, she constructs, as you saw, this constantly shifting mental model of what the world is. I would say that she worlds in the active sense as a verb in order to make sense of the shifting data she's receiving. What we see then as the gamer is this process of worlding. We're seeing Ray's mental models at work. For instance, did Ray's world contain a clothesline or a scarecrow? We never really know, it changes. So that might not be the right question to ask. I would say we should rather ask, which mental models help Ray survive? Which visual interface can she construct in order to best navigate the constant stream of data she's working through? Now, I've used the term interface a few times, but it's important to ask, what, what is an interface? So typically, we think of an interface as it relates to technology. The interface is that interconnective and interactive boundary between computer systems and people that allow communication and action to flow both ways. Lev Manovich writes, a number of different interfaces can be created from the same data. A new media object can be defined as one or more interfaces to a multimedia database. So just like for Ray, there was a low level strata of raw data, sound input, haptic input, upon which multiple possible high level world interfaces were built, the shifting world that we see in the game. Lev Manovich goes on to say, new media in general can be thought of as consisting of two distinct layers, the cultural layer, and the computer layer. For instance, the folders and windows and trash cans we have on our computer desktop are, are interfaces, which are to say they are just models for understanding computation. And they're not necessarily the only ones we need to use. The key word here is models. So what is the difference between a world and a world model? The answer, I think, can be found in consciousness. So Douglas Hofstetter is a mathematician and a philosopher, and he's one of my favorite thinkers on, on consciousness. And here is his theory of consciousness. Human brains are pattern recognition systems. Our brains recognize patterns and then create a robust repertoire of categories, symbols, to stand in for these patterns like proper names. So for instance, I see a bunch of green stuff and a bunch of brown stuff. A pattern is found and then named leaf or bark. And then these new symbols are grouped together into a larger pattern named tree. And then these are then grouped into a new pattern called forest and so on. And these symbols then kind of nest like Russian dolls. The thing is this high level dance of symbols is blind to the low level processing of patterns. So we selves never experience the chemical patterns, the firing of neurons that constitute our world and our self. We are thus modeling systems that naively think the models we interact with are the world. But can we truly speak of one world? If worlds are just models, then how many worlds are there? So Richard Dawkins uh, speaks to this question in a great TED talk called The Middle World. In this talk, he addresses not the very small quantum world and not the very large general relativity world, but the middle world of humans and human consciousness. I'm showing you this video because I think in like a minute and a half, he does a fantastic job describing the myriad of worlds that consciousness can produce. So really, isn't a word that we should use with simple confidence. If a neutrino had a brain, which had evolved in neutrino-sized ancestors, it would say that rocks really do consist of empty space. We have brains that evolved in medium-sized ancestors, which couldn't walk through rocks. Really, for an animal, is whatever its brain needs it to be, 
in order to assist its survival. And because different species live in different worlds, there will be a discomforting variety <coughs> of realies. What we see of the real world is not the unvarnished world, but a model of the world, regulated and adjusted by sense data, but constructed so it's useful for dealing with the real world. The nature of the model depends on the kind of animal we are. A flying animal needs a different kind of model from a walking, climbing, or swimming animal. A monkey's brain must have software capable of simulating a three-dimensional world of branches and trunks. A mole software for constructing models of its world will be customized for underground use. A water strider's brain doesn't need 3D software at all since it lives on the surface of the pond in an Edwin Abbott flatland. So Nelson Goodman speaks to this concept when he says, we are not speaking in terms of multiple possible alternatives to a single actual world, but of multiple actual worlds. How to interpret such terms as real, unreal, fictive, and possible is a subsequent question. So perhaps a journey into contemporary video games can shed some light on these questions. So video game scholar Christian Jorgensen concisely ties many of these ideas together in her concept of a game world. For Jorgensen, there is no difference between a game's world and a game's interface. Just like our world models and consciousness, the game world is the interface. Jorgensen writes, as a representational form, a game world is a metaphor that contextualizes an abstract game system in the shape of a world. It presents the conceptual game rules through a world environment that can be interacted with and explored in different ways. So I propose that exploration here is the key. Exploration, as I would define it, is the embodied spatial practice that intertwines worlds and identities in a mutually constitutive feedback loop. Exploration activates places and turns them into worlds. In video games, we are not passive. We, we act upon the world. We shape the world. We world in the active sense. In return, the world affects us, sculpting our identity, our desires, our emotions, what we think, who we think we are and what we think we are capable of doing in these spaces. So Michel Dussereteau writes about this process in The Practice of Everyday Life. He describes how places, which can be thought of as these abstract potentialities, are activated or traversed by people who fill places with meaning, thus transforming them into spaces. These activated spaces, these worlds filled with people, are narratives. These are stories full of emotion. De Sorteau writes, stories traverse and organize places. They select and link them together. They are spatial trajectories. Every story is a travel story, a spatial practice. So let's explore some of these spatial narratives and see how they're constructed. So before coming to Stanford, I worked as a lead producer for many years at the Ant Farm. Uh, at Ant Farm, I had the privilege of working with the best talent in, in the marketing business. Rob Troy, Scott Cookson, David Wilson, Jay Trumbull, Patricio Hoder, Aaron Fenn, Josh Rothenberger, Sean Brust, Eric Van Alstine, and so many others that I could go on for hours, but this is not an Academy Awards speech, so I'll save you that. Hopefully, with their forgiveness, this photo will do. So this is our team. It takes this many people to make the work you're about to see. Making video game narratives are immensely collaborative acts. In fact, I think that all intellectual and cultural production is. Even in academia, don't let anyone tell you that anything only ever comes from one person. It is always only ever about the people and the plural. So one of my primary clients at Ant Farm was Ubisoft, whose marketing team is actually here in San Francisco. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to be the lead producer on the campaign for Assassin's Creed IV, Black Flag. So for those who don't know, Assassin's Creed is a historical fiction video game series. Uh, it focuses on such time periods as Renaissance Italy, the French Revolution, or in this case, the founding and dissolving of the Pirate Republic in the West Indies in the 1700s. So, a quick disclaimer. 
Uh, these games focus on historical conflicts and are thus very violent. So the trailers I'm about to show you feature a lot of this violence in kind of gratuitous ways. So uh, please be warned, if expressions of violence make you uncomfortable, you might want to skip this section. So I'm going to show you two trailers, not back to back, but overall two trailers from the same campaign. And the reason I'm showing you two is because they've been separated by many months of the development process. Um, and this means over the course of these months, the world changed. So these two trailers can be sort of seen as a microcosm for the larger project of building a narrative out of space. So as you watch, pay special attention to the use of space and location and how the actor and the space work together to produce meaning and story. So this is called a reveal trailer, since it is the, public, the first public reveal of in-game footage, the very first trailer. Uh, the reveal trailer often comes out about a year before the game is done and released. This means that we're working with a work in progress build of the game. Oftentimes this means that the script is still being revised, no story cutscenes have been produced, large narrative segments of the game code are missing, and oftentimes voice actors haven't been recorded yet. Which is to say, all we really have to work with is the world, the game world itself, the ability to place virtual actors within this world. This means that our methodology as an advertising agency is vastly different from making a movie trailer. Now, in a movie trailer, roughly, you start with a two-hour movie, and in the process of editorial, you cut it down to about two minutes. So with games, all we have are worlds. But how does one tell a story about a world? So the key to what we do is emotion. The central question that, dr that drove our methodology was this. What does it feel like to play this game, to be in this world, to be these people? Our trailers then uh, are, are create narratives by exploring these worlds and navigating these different identities via their emotional impact. How does it feel? What is it like? What do you see? What can you do? I'll show you another one now, which is much later in the development process.
It is advertising after all. <laughs> so this trailer came out a bit later in the year. We had a much more world to explore and material to work with. Uh, the focus of this trailer, as you saw, was naval combat, what it feels like to be the pirate captain of a ship, and what it's like taking a uh, naval fort from the sea. Now for those not familiar with games, there is one important point that needs to be made. The story in this trailer is not the story of the game. If we did our job correctly, then this hopefully looks like an epic key scene in some grand narrative, but I can assure you that it is not. You are not guaranteed to have this type of experience if you play this game. Uh, games are not stories, but are first and foremost worlds. So the narrative here is merely a trajectory, a possible movement through space and time based off of our decisions, our explorations, our actions are certain choices. The story thus comes together through the activation of space via exploration. And you as the actor take direct action and shape the world itself, directing scenes through the decisions that you make. And in turn, the game world affects who you are by sculpting what is important to you, by shaping meanings and inscribing them onto your virtual body. So narrative is thus a circuit linking worlds and identities, action and affect, around the act of exploration. And this is exactly how these trailers were made. We began with the game world and with the core identity of being a pirate. We then gathered a team around this circuit. So we had music supervisors in the room, listening to the, what the world sounded like and parsing out what sounds might drive a compelling story. We have writers in the room working with the characters, their motivations and intentions, and crafting possible narration. We then spend the most time capturing footage. So at Ant Farm, we work uh, closely with the game developers to code for us unique in-game tools, allowing us to treat the game worlds essentially as enormous virtual film sets. Our in-game cinematographers and directors, such as Jay Trumbull in this case, spends weeks exploring, building scenarios and assembling moments. In essence, we film a short film in a virtual world. All of this then comes together in the process of editorial, where the editor, in this case, Patricio Hoder, crafted all of these elements into the emotional narrative that you see. And there are, of course, many more steps, but I'll save you a lot of the technical details. The key here, then, is that these video game trailers are emotional narratives crafted from a complex mix of world exploration, its affect on actors within the virtual space, and the key actions you, the gamer, they, can take to shape this world in unique ways. 
This is to say, the story is not imposed from the top down, but rather emerges bottom up from a complex mix of factors. The story emerges. So this notion of emergence is then central to what it means to explore a game world. So John Conway's Game of Life is a mathematical and visual simulation of an emergent phenomenon known as cellular automata. The rules of this game are simple, and there are only three. Given a random starting state, an off square, if an off square has exactly three neighbors, it is turned on. This is birth. If a square is on with two or three neighbors, then it continues living. This is happiness. If a square is on with less than two neighbors, it will die from loneliness. Or if it has more than three neighbors, it will die from overcrowding. So those three rules. And that's it. However, this is just a looping GIF. As you can see, very curious things begin to happen. What we're looking at has been termed a glider gun. So a glider gun is this bouncing pattern at the top. So uh, a glider gun is a complex reoccurring pattern that produces what are called gliders. So a glider are these things going down to the corner. A glider is a pattern that is able to travel across space while roughly maintaining its form. Thus, our three simple rules have produced patterns that seem to display complex behavior, not found in the rules themselves. We have locomotion. We have the traversal of space. We have the production of larger entities. Another word for this generative process of complexity from simple rules is emergence. So Jesper Jewell, a video game scholar, explains, emergence represents a higher level pattern that is the result of interactions between many lower level entities. Classical examples of emergence are life, life as molecules, consciousness, the result of interactions between brain cells, anthills, there is no leader, uh, sorry, there is no central command in an anthill, and bird flocks, there is no leader in a bird flock. For emergence, the whole is indeed more than the sum of its parts. That was Jesper Jewell. So this low level, high level structure should jump out at you by now as a pattern in and of itself as it's been a recurring theme throughout this talk. As we've seen, this structure applies to the interface, to consciousness, and to emergence and complexity. However, and this is a huge distinction, unlike in the game of life, which is relatively simple, each of these structures is not deterministic. For instance, many possible interfaces can apply to the same subset of data. Consciousness is an ever-shifting realm of patterns, symbols, and models. And complexity is, well, very complex. Thus, we need one last term to be able to understand the possibility that is opened up with all of the potential worlds and models and interfaces that can emerge from this process. So let's look at chess for a moment, which is much more complex than the game of life. Raymond Reed writes, there are 400 different positions after each player makes one move apiece. There are 72,084 positions after two moves apiece. There are nine plus million positions after three moves apiece. There are 288 plus billion different possible positions after four moves apiece. There are therefore more potential games of chess than the number of electrons in the universe. So Jane McGonigal, a great video game scholar, responds to this writing, the possibility space of chess is so massive and complex that one individual has no hope of understanding or exploring it fully. To play chess is to become part of this problem-solving network. It means joining a massively collaborative effort to become intimately familiar with an otherwise unfathomably complex possibility space. When enough people play a game, it becomes a massively collaborative study of a problem, an extreme scale test of potential action in a specific possibility space. So our final keyword then for today is thus possibility space. I now want to attempt to fuse all of these ideas together and in the spirit of the interface and because I myself am a visual learner, 
I want to map these core ideas onto images, which might help conceptualization. So at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that our destination was going to be an understanding of how exploration works. My thesis was that exploration is the embodied act of creating worlds and identities. This section will then be our map to get there, or rather a series of maps for the different intellectual terrains. This is a picture of a geyser, of water emerging from the earth and bubbling into a froth. This geyser will represent our wide view, looking at the larger structure of, um, of emergence that we just discussed. Here we can conceptualize low-level data emergently producing high-level patterns of complexity. This is the two-tier structure that we've seen a few times now. The low level is our raw material. This is the earth uh, in the geyser metaphor. This is the material data that rises upwards in the process of emergence. Here is the, the high level of our structure, the bubbling froth of worlds, the different interfaces, the world models of consciousness, the emergent patterns of complexity. Here is the, the full image of the geyser then. The gap between these two levels, between the material data and the symbolic world models, is the possibility space of emergence. Possibility space here in this image is both the body of the geyser and the hole, the opening from which the froth emerges. Here we see the material data has the possibility to actualize in different ways, combining to form different patterns, different models, different worlds, etc. Imagine now that we're not looking at the geyser from the side, but from the top, top down. This is a picture of a sunflower. Flowers and petals blooming in sort of a spiral fractal pattern. This fractal blooming is key. The sunflower will represent our medium view for understanding possibility space from within. So for better or worse, we don't have a God's eye view. We never see the geyser because we ourselves are part of the geyser. To be specific, the part of us that is a self constitutes the upper part of the geyser, the high-level bubbling of symbols and models. This is our perspective. We're studying a process from within the process. Thus, the whole of the geyser, the possibility space of emergence, for us is dark, opaque. This possibility space is seen as dark or unknown from, uh, by us from within the system for three reasons. First, because from within we do not see the process of emergence happen. Second, we are not gods. Thus, we do not know all of the low-level rules or data or starting conditions, etc. Even if we could learn every rule, we could only know it from our perspective using our sense organs. Thus, we can never know everything. Lastly, our brains open the emergent gap wider with its ability to model the same data in various possible ways. As this image shows, multiple identities can emerge from the same core set of personal data within a possibility space. Multiple worlds can bloom forth from each interaction. Just like these petals, oftentimes identities and worlds overlap, but more often than not, they differ. This is because different identities act on worlds in different ways, shaping them into different worlds, and different worlds affect us in different ways, shaping how we feel, what we believe we can do, what is important to us, making us, in a sense, different types of people in different types of spaces. Thus, from the dark unknown of possibility space as seen from within, we witness a vast fractal blooming of worlds and identities. Now let's understand this process in more detail by zooming into a single set of these petals. So this is going to be our close-up image, even though this is an enormous image. This is the Hourglass Nebula and one of the most beautiful and haunting images I've ever seen. It works nicely here, not only because it has sort of cosmic implications, but because it kind of just looks like a Venn diagram. This is a Venn diagram with an essential twist. Our central overlap between these two spheres, instead of being both sides in combination, is rather, here in this map, kind of neither side. It's kind of like this strange God's eye, this void, this hole. So the I, as we discussed in the last map, is possibility space. Possibility space, as seen from within, from our perspective, is dark. It is unknown. Thus, possibility space, as the unknown, necessitates exploration. 
We explore the unknown. We discover by means of exploration. And now we can finally understand my core thesis. The exploration of possibility space is the embodied and cognitive process of creating worlds and identities, which we can understand as emergent models and designed interfaces for navigating and affecting raw data. The blooming of worlds and identities are thus locked into a mutually constitutive feedback loop where identities, subjects, actors, us, act on worlds through performed action, and worlds act on bodies through affect. Thus, as you can see in this image, the Venn diagram arc of worlds pushes down on identities via affect, directly shaping who we are, and the Venn diagram arc of identity pushes up on worlds through performance, through direct action, shaping the world itself. All of this is able to happen because of the central unknown at the core, the possibility space that necessitates exploration. This entire circuit of worlds and identities and exploration as a whole produces narratives. Narratives are constellations of subjects in space-time. Story and emotion emerge from this process. They are this process. And this is how meaning gets generated in this process. Meaning we can think of as an isomorphism, a mapping of these two levels on top of one another, the low level and the high level. Meaning in human reason is the ability to make jumps between different levels of understanding and make inferences across patterns. So these three drawings then uh, I've made are going to be our three maps for understanding the exploration of possibility space and the generation and, and interaction between worlds and identities. These are the three key visual representations for my core thesis. And I would argue that all of this links directly back to video games. Video games as, as an exploration-based media are an ideal microcosm for understanding this entire process because exploration and the creation of worlds and identities are at the heart of such media. I mean, video games are explorable conceptual models. And the feedback loop of worlds and identities via performance and affect is how we play in these worlds. And lastly, games as code partake in this larger ecology of emergence and complexity. So in conclusion, I want to highlight two historical facts that haunt these lines of thinking and then propose a possible alternative trajectory. So as the work of Stanford's own Fred Turner shows, the types of cybernetic frameworks used in much of this presentation have a complicated history of their own, emerging from post-World War II military projects such as the Air Defense Project SAGE and only gaining intellectual prominence through the countercultural appropriation of computer-based metaphors. Having personally worked on Call of Duty, I can assure you that the links between video games and the military remains very strong. Two, as scholars Henry Jenkins and Mary Fuller point out, the impulses behind spatial exploration in Western society, as seen in many video games, has its own complicated history with imperialism and colonialism. In their sense, exploring the frontier represents a struggle for the possession of desirable space. So the frontier is thus a very problematic concept. However, I would propose that literary theory might provide us with some different intellectual tools, perhaps allowing us certain non-colonialist aspirations. So returning to, to, to De Certeau, he writes about narrative frontiers not only as borders, but as liminal spaces, as the space between spaces. These frontiers are thus regions of ambiguity and are the common shared points between disparate categories, sites of paradox, of combination, of possibility. He writes, a middle place of interactions and interviews, the frontier is a sort of void, a narrative symbol of exchanges and encounters. Now there is another word in literary theory for such a paradoxical space. This is the chiasm. So the chiasm is a device that comes from the Greek letter chi, which looks like the letter X. In poetry, it produces a simple inverting of terms. So a famous chiasm comes from the Bible, which is the first shall be last and the last shall be first. 
So as you can see, this device works by simply moving the two terms down the x to the point where they switch places. However, M Maurice Merleau-Ponty extends this literary device into the realm of philosophy. He asks, what happens at that middle point in the x, that frontier, so to speak, where when the two terms are crossing, they become, for a moment, indistinguishable? What is this moment? What does it feel like? So Merleau-Ponty believes that our very flesh is this. Our skin is the border protecting our body and the sense organ reaching outwards into the world. Skin thus produces a sort of intertwining, a combining of inside with outside. Our bodies then are this frontier, and to explore, to touch, is to engage with the world chiasmically. Merleau-Ponty writes, by a sort of chiasm, we become others and we become world. Is this not the empathetic potential of playing video games? Is this not the imperative that video games have to live up to? Becoming others, not just one identity, but a multitude. Becoming world, not just one world, but endless worlds, each with their overlaps and each with their gaps, their interstices, their spaces between spaces. These are the sites for new modes of consciousness. And I would argue that these are the sites for new modes of empathy. I believe that games have the potential to enable these types of spaces. Thank you. <laughs>